Welcome to Hustle and Flow with Heather Hubbard, episode 150. Hi, I'm Heather Hubbard, and I was a litigator partner and practice group leader at an AMLAW 200 firm. I know what it takes to rise to the top. I also know all too well the toll it can take on your personal life. So how do you shine bright without burning out? How do you embrace your ambition without selling your soul? You're listening to the Hustle and Flow podcast. Welcome back. I am your host, Heather Hubbard. Thank you so much for joining me. We have a really special guest today. And I met her last year, immediately loved her. She's so funny and sarcastic in the best kind of way. And, you know, I didn't really know her or what she stood for or her beliefs or anything. And we bonded over something that was a little bit sexist. You know, sometimes I have a hard time, even even though I practice mindfulness, I sometimes get a little triggered and reactive when I hear certain things. And then I just made an off the cuff comment, my response, and she totally agreed. And so we bonded and we've we are definitely in cahoots. She is from the tech world and really is a titan in that industry and a leader as a woman. And so I cannot wait for you to meet her and to hear our conversation But before we get to that, I wanted to let you know two things. One is we are filling the fourth pod for the 2020 experience. So that group is running April to December. And we are kicking off at Miraval in Tucson, April 19th through the 22nd. We are also pre-filling the 2021 Mastermind. It's going to look exactly the same, but the price is going up. We are limiting the number of people who can actually get in this pre-sale portion in the first quarter, but it allows you to lock in the 2020 pricing. So you just pay a deposit now if we accept you in and you want that spot and you then don't have to make your payment election or start making other payments until August. So if you are like, I know I want to do 2021 and I want to lock in the 2020 pricing, lock in my spot, and then I can go ahead and start preparing for knowing that's coming. I highly encourage you to go ahead and apply. And if you think you want in that fourth pod running April to December, highly encourage you to apply for that as well. So you can find out more and you can apply at 2020mastermindexperience.com. All right, let's get to the interview with Kathy. All right, so I am so excited to introduce you guys to our special guest today, Kathy Clotes Guest. She is amazing. She has all the degrees. She is a lifelong student. She has a master's in multimedia. She has a master's in communications. She has an MBA. And, you know, she didn't just go to, you know, the local community college for this. She went to Stanford. She went to Berkeley. And I'm already messing up this bio because... It's making me have this thought. The way that we met was actually at a training together where I practice a part of the speech that no longer is in there. But I asked the question of, do you remember who was your commencement speaker? And Kathy was like, yes, mine was Oprah. So we might come back to that. And she was a marketing and communications exec in Silicon Valley for many, many years before she walked away to start her own company called Keep It human. So she is currently a keynote speaker and author of the book, Stop Boring Me, which was named a must read book for 2017 on Inc.com. And so she leads workshops and facilitations. And for her, it's all about less jargon, more humanity in, I think, company culture, as well as marketing and branding. Does this sound right, Kathy? Am I describing what you do correctly? Because I'm just so impressed with (laughs) <laughs> everything you've done and what you're doing now. Oh man, you did a great job. The only thing, the only thing is technically it is keep in like uh, the gerund, keeping it human.com. Ah, and mean. that is the only that, no, you did a beautiful job. You did a job better than I would do. So yeah, you're hired. <laughs> Yes. Yes. All right. Well, we'll have that correct for sure in the show notes, keeping it human.com. So I have so many questions for you, but first, since I already brought it up, Oprah. Yeah. Like everybody always, like when I was doing that speech, they're like, yeah, who, who remembers who their commencement speaker was? And you're like, yeah, my mom was Oprah. (laughs) 
right. I mean, who has Oprah as their commencement speaker? You right. Do. Right. Well, and you know what? So graduate school at Stanford and the reason we had Oprah is the, you know, Gail's, Gail King's daughter, Kirby, was graduating undergrad the year that I graduated from grad school at Stanford. And so Kirby is, is the stepdaughter to Oprah. And the way I understand it, it was like a, one of the presents to give to Kirby, which was great. I was a beneficiary of just being, I think, in the right place at the right time. I love and I was also at, at this commencement, I was pregnant with my son and Oprah comes walking down the, you know, she's flanked by all the, you know, the dignitaries of the school and they're all decked out with their tassels and their, you know, professorial gear. And it's like, you know, it's like, like any woman when they come within, I think, you know, like a 10 mile radius of Oprah, like everyone's like, ah, uh. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's like my DNA at a cellular level, being a woman, it was just like, you know, just, you couldn't help it. I mean, it was just so, it was so darn exciting. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I was just in her presence. So in Marrakesh, we were staying at the same hotel and I never got to see her. We kept like missing each other. And she was on the property. It was very small. And I just felt, yeah, like I was in the presence of not just like the queen, but like Mother Earth, right? And was just soaking it in. So what do you remember? Like, was there a big takeaway? Yeah, you know, one of the things that I really loved, I just really love because she told stories and, you know, I'm a storyteller, you're a storyteller. And, and so that just worked for my brain. And I just remember her telling the story of becoming who she is and leaning into who you are. And I'll never forget, she really told the story of how when she first started out, she was an anchor on the local news. And, you know, they told her to change everything about herself, including her name. Yep. It was too ethnic. It was like they said, you really should change your name. Oprah Winfrey, no one's the Oprah. What name is that? And they just, just about told her to change everything about herself. And of course, as we know, the big lesson is her ability to empathize and to connect with people is so off the charts that had she changed anything about who she was, she would not be who she is. And so it was about the choices that you make to become who you're meant to be in the world. Mm -hmm. And I just love that because I think it's the thing that we all need to hear. We don't hear it enough. We are not misfits. We are meant to be who we are. We just need to remember that and to lean into that. And I, I think that was just a, a phenomenal, you know, message that everybody needed to hear. And so, of course, everybody was like screaming over her. Right. <laughs> of course, here's the thing I do remember, and I still have it, is so she, in true Oprah fashion, you know, she doesn't leave an audience empty handed. She brought gifts. So under all the chairs were books. She left books uh, for everybody. And that year there were two books and I can't believe one of them I'm forgetting, but there were two books that everybody got tied with a, a ribbon around it, an Oprah congratulations green ribbon. And one of the books was uh, Dan Pink's book. He had a book out at the time and um, he talked about humanity and business. And it was, you know, it, it was a great book. And the other book, I, and this is bad, I I'm, I'm, can't remember, but <laughs> I just remember she left everybody, you know, under every seat in the stadium, everybody got a, a couple of books and that was just, yeah. All right. Well, it's actually a great segue, what you were saying she was sharing mm -hmm. into what you stand for, because I have heard you talk, right? About, I mean, you were a woman in corporate in the tech world, right? Like yeah. I assumed that there weren't too many of you. No. And so I've heard a little bit of that, but I would love for you to share you know, what that was like and, you know, struggling to perhaps be who you really are when others aren't necessarily encouraging that. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because I spent 14 and a half years in tech. And when I left, I was running marketing teams and I worked my way up literally from just being kind of, you know, uh, in sales and all that other stuff in product. And then I moved over to marketing communications and eventually I was leading big teams and managing communications for tech companies. And it was a, in 14 and a half years, I will say, the hardest thing for me was I would often be what they call the only lonely. 
or, you know, the, because I would be the only woman in a room. It wasn't unusual for me to be the only woman in a room sometimes in meetings or the only woman, you know, in when I was doing stand-up comedy at the time, because I also have a comedy background and an improv background is I would be the only woman on a comedy night where there'd be 14 comics and I'd be the only woman. It was not unusual or one of two women. These two worlds that I kind of lived in and were my day-to-day existence were very, very male dominated. So you can imagine all the, all the challenges that that brings. There was diversity in terms of men. Like there was good racial diversity with men, but the companies that I were in were, you know, 80, 85% male dominated. Marketing was still very heavily, especially on the product side, very heavily male dominated. The executive staff, male dominated. The boards, men. And so, you know, all the things you can think of that happened, they happened. Everything that, you know, if you're in a male dominated industry, you know, you feel it. And so there, there was always a, a heaviness being the only woman, because even though you really only speak for Kathy, it felt like you were sometimes like, you know, speaking for women when you weren't and everything you did was, you know, dissected, second guessed. And it's a tough way to operate. It's a tough way to operate. I'm curious, you know, with your improv and your humor, Mm -hmm. did that help you or hurt you? How did they see that? Both. (laughs) You know, it was a really mixed bag. And it's really interesting. Looking back, there were men that I think really... So there, there was a guy, there was a sales VP when I was new to this company and I was probably, you know, 23, 24. It doesn't matter that, you know, what my, my education background is. I look a certain way. I'm blonde. I'm petite. I'm on the phone with a client, a sales VP from another department looks around, can't find our admin. I'm not an admin. You know, at this time I was a product manager. I'm on the phone. He interrupts my phone call and he says, when you get a chance, I'd like a cup of coffee. Yeah. So I looked right at him. I said, hold on to the client, covered up the, you know, cause we didn't have, you know, headsets and stuff, you know, right. the old landline. So I covered up the, you know, the part of the phone and I looked right out and I said, you know what? I'd like one too. You know, the coffee room is over there. So on your way back, why don't you bring me a cup as well? <laughs> and he just looked right at me and all the color went out of his, like, it just went out of his face. But what was so great about that is because probably within about a week, he started changing the way he was talking with me. And I think me standing up for myself with a sense of humor, without making it a big deal, without a lecture, just me being me, you know, I converted him. And he and I got along really well after that. And then there were some men that didn't like, you know, women with a sense of humor, right? They just didn't like it. They didn't know what to do with that. They were like, okay, she's not like the other ones. She's not pliable. (laughs) She's not easily dismissed. What do we do here? So it was funny because Heather, and you can appreciate, and I think a lot of women can, humor is a really important tool for connecting, for relationships. And I don't care what people say, use it anyway, but the research is really clear and it bears out my experience, which is there is a double standard. There's a penalty box for women. Women are expected to be funny and men like funny women, but not too funny. Don't be too funny. If you're too funny and you're funnier than the men, there is a little bit of that double-edged sword. Yeah. Yes. Just don't be too much, right? Of anything, really. Don't be too much. Don't be too funny. Don't be too smart. Don't do this enough. Don't look a certain way. Like, don't do that. You're too much. Yeah. All the boxes, all the boxes. But one of the things that I did learn is that while there are some men that really did not like that, here's what I discovered. That when men tried to give me a hard time and I could respond with humor, more often than not, I earned more respect. And I think they realized that I was not easily intimidated. I was not fragile, that I was smart and I could hold my own. And it was amazing how many men changed the way that they treated me because of that. So you don't convert everybody, but then again, you know what? (laughs) Nobody does. I think what it did for me is it just showed people that I was tougher than they might've thought just by the way I look and navigate the world. And I I remember converting men who I thought were just a bunch of jerks and just by not letting that get to me and it got to me, I'd go to the bathroom and I'd cry, but I wouldn't do that in in front of them. I think it changed, fortunately for me, it changed the way some of them interacted with me. Where do you think we're headed? I mean, I get you and I have kind of exited out of corporate, but we still deal with, you know, the way that we work with others, the companies that we work with, keynote speaking, all of this, right? We've come a long way. 
but we still have a really, really long way to go. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I know you and I both feel strongly about this, but, you know, I feel like tech is very similar to law and some of these just other really male dominated industries. And, you know, I'm curious, where do you see we're making progress and where do we really still have a lot of work to do, at least in the spaces that you're in, you know, whether it's keynote speaking, tech, anything else? Yeah, it's a great question. I think we've reached a level of like threshold of awareness where it no longer flies. So now I think the imperative is just like right there and it can't be ignored. So what we're seeing is this backlash to, you know, sort of the, everybody talks about the bro culture in tech, which is very true. It's very male dominated. You know, I can quote you all kinds of statistics. Many of them you already know, because it looks like law or construction or every other industry. And, you know, 1.7% of all venture capital funding went to women led startups. Yeah last year. I mean, it's still woefully inadequate and it's still a huge problem. Women on boards, women at the highest levels of of companies. The good news is I think we're at this point where women, you know, are and people of color and everybody were rising up and we're saying no more. And this is a problem. And I do believe that it's top of mind now. We're actually having conversations, which we've never had before. It used to be you'd shut that down and nobody would talk about it. You'd get talked over and, you know, and now it's unavoidable. We're having those conversations. That's the great news. The tough news is that we have yet to have the ripple effect where it shows up. I'm seeing a lot of diversity talk in hiring, but I, frankly, in tech, I am not seeing women on boards or in the C-suite at the highest levels where they feed into policy making, where they have a chance to actually change the culture. So we're getting there. We're not getting there fast. According to some reports, there's been a backlash against me too. And I, that worries me, but I think overall what's happening more and more is that people are speaking up. You can't ignore, you know, the 30% of women and people of color and all of that, that are speaking up and saying no more, no more. And it's, there's a reckoning. I think we're going to increasingly see a culture reckoning. We're, we're, we're right on that precipice. I think something interesting in the next couple of years, I can feel it is, is going to happen. I feel that too. You guys, great news. The 2020 planners, Project Pad and Bookmarks are finally here. More than a typical planner, it is a complete planning system that will revolutionize the way you approach your days, weeks, months, and years. It will help you achieve your biggest goals and work on that to-do list so that you can take back your day and focus on what matters most. Get yours now at lifeinlawplanner.com. CES. Let's talk about that. But mm. Shelly Zalis, we had her on the podcast. I don't remember. It might've been a year ago. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with her, but she was at CES one year and she was wanted to go and was just like, where are all the women? And so she got all of these others together and did this like power of the pack where they all walked in. And you would think, well, that would have been a big movement. And we would have had a big shift, but you know, there's still not very many women talking on that stage. Yeah. I'm curious, you know, you kind of have an insider look. I'm just kind of curious as to your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's it's a big thing. It's a huge deal. CES, Consumer Electronics Show, is one of the biggest shows for the consumer products, um, electronics products industry around the world in Vegas. And in 2018, 2018 was a, was a linchpin year because in 2018, they claimed, oh, we can't find a woman keynote. And like, all the women are like, where the hell are you looking? <laughs> <laughs> Because we're literally everywhere. We are 51% of the population. And the only reason the other 49% of you live is because we allow you to. <laughs> it's like, where are you looking? You know, this, this whole pipeline nonsense. It's like, are you, are you dumb? Are you looking at actual oil pipelines? Like, what pipeline are you right. looking? We're everywhere. And so that didn't go over well. And what happened is there was such a backlash to 2018. Even the CEO of HP, who is a man who happens to have, I think, four daughters, four or five, like all daughters was like, you know, this is unacceptable. You need to change this. So male CEOs started speaking up and there was a tipping point to where in 2019, they did have women keynotes. Now, why in 2020, this year in January, they said they couldn't find it. We're back to the same place. I don't know why. So it feels like two steps forward, you know, three steps back sometimes. I think it's going to have to change. You know, it's it's changing because women aren't 
being quiet about it and and we shouldn't be. They're demanding change. And I think companies, it's going to happen when the money stops. So if we want to, if we want to affect change, I, I would say to sponsors and advertisers who send people to CES, just shut the money spigot off. Because if the money flow stops, CES is going to get on board. Yeah. You know, and I think for our male colleagues, right, who are allies, and I think there are plenty of them, if you can hear that as well, right? Like, you know, because I know it's not just women who listen to this podcast, you know, if you're attending conferences and they're all men speakers, or if you have been asked to speak and you see that there aren't any women or, you know, diversity in general, don't go. Well, one, say something, right? Like, see if you can't change it. And two, don't spend money on, you know, we're trying to stop spending money. We would ask that you do the same thing because yeah, just making requests without there being any kind of penalty. I don't think we're going to see much change. Okay. So let's talk about, there's so much I want to talk about. All right. Let's talk about this. Okay. So you are right. You were talking about improv earlier. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm curious. It sounds like, I mean, even when you were in tech, right? Like, was that, was that kind of like a creative outlet for you? You know, interestingly enough, it was and it wasn't. So I, when I started in tech right after college, I, five nights a week, six nights a week, I would be doing comedy. And I parallel path it for a long time. And, and over time, I started to bring in, you know, improv and comedy elements into my work. And, you know, I'm a big believer in forgiveness, not permission. And so little by little, I just started, you know, doing training, a marketing training, campaigns. Every time I was asked to do a training for executives, I would use my humor and everything that I did. And pretty soon I got to be known as like, if you want something done well, go to, you know, whatever. If you want something done well and funny, go to Kathy. So I started being asked to be the point person for like campaigns, for sales, asked me to train their salespeople on speaking and things like that. So I started bringing more of that internally into companies and not waiting necessarily to be asked. Mm. There were times though, where, you know, I tried very hard to like get us to do something that wasn't so stuffy and boring. And, you know, people get conservative, you know, especially you want to, here's how you kill creativity, get lawyers in the room. (laughs) (laughs) No disrespect to lawyers. I'm just saying. Oh, Um, it's so true. You know what I mean? And it's like, way to, way to kill fun, everybody. You know, you know, kill (laughs) fun, legal and HR. That's what kills me. And so it just, it got to be challenging because there were times where I'd have ideas on how we could use more creativity. And the nice part about it is I found ways to sneak it in because my boss would come to me sometimes and say, okay, just do it. I don't know about it. Just don't screw it up. And usually that I didn't screw it up. And so he was like, okay, that was good. You know? So I was lucky. I had bosses that were, as long as I did my job, they were like, how will you do it? I'm going to let you do you because you're good at you doing you. And so it kind of got a little creative, but over time, you know, I realized eventually tech was just not where I could be. It was, it was too constraining, too scared, too stiff, too afraid to take risks. Also, you know, tough being a funny woman in that male dominated space. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this, because I've actually heard a few women say this recently. I have a client who she would love to be, she says like her secret dream is to be a stand-up comic. And I know these other women, right, that are in these, you know, they've been in a profession for a really long time. And the thought of like, that that's what they would do. But so I'm just, for those women out there who are like, yeah, I've kind of always had the secret dream. Do you have any recommendations for them? One, just to test it out or to have a creative outlet? How do you even go about doing that? Because I feel like there's a lot of women out there who are really funny, love to do it and just don't know how, or they're, you know, afraid or they're concerned about what others would think. Yes. All of those are true. Yes, yes, yes. And yes. And here's the thing I would say. So a couple things. First, really, really own your funny. Don't worry about what everybody thinks. Yeah. There's going to be people who don't care, but who cares, right? Who cares what they think? It doesn't really matter. Use your funny because it's a relationship skill. And I think women hold back. Because of that penalty box. Yeah, there is a double standard for funny women. There always will be. First of all, who gives a shit what they think? <laughs> Don't worry about that. The second thing I would say is, here's the thing. Just go and sign up for some open mic nights. 
some places, I mean, every city usually has like clubs that have open mic nights. And that means anybody can usually sign up to get on stage and get at least they'll give you five minutes, you know, to do whatever, you know, and you're supposed to fail. You're supposed to suck for a while before you get better. You've got to work it. A lot of times people get up there, they have a horrific experience the first couple of times and then they give up. And I'm here to tell you, you got to look at it as a long term thing, because the first couple of times you do an open mic, yeah, you're going to suck. Nobody's born knowing how to do this right out of the womb. Very rare. It's rare because you have to learn the, the craft of joke writing. So here's what I say. Throw yourself in open mic nights. There are places that sometimes will have joke writing classes. Sometimes comedy clubs will offer them. They'll teach them. And then here's a really good book. And I'm not paid by Judy Carter, but she's got the comedy Bible. I know Judy Carter, but I'm not getting kickbacks. Just want to put that out there. Her book, the comedy Bible was one of the first books I picked up right out of college. I picked up that. Here's what I did. I went and got myself the comedy Bible. I earmarked the crap out of that. I read it you know, forwards, backwards, diagonal in my sleep, wrote jokes and honestly got myself up on open mic night and did that for about three, four years. And then I was doing showcases pretty soon. I was headlining clubs. Then I, you know, threw myself into improv and that's a different animal, but go get that book, get a team of people who community is very important. Find a local, maybe joke writing or writing group that will support you. We can give each other feedback, get encouragement along the way. It's really important to have your posse of people that are going to have your back and keep doing it. Keep doing it. Don't give up. Keep doing it. Keep honing it and, and be in community and just keep showing up. And I promise you, if you keep doing that consistently, you know, three to five times a week, it's a muscle within a couple of years. My God, it'll be, it will just be like a, a muscle for you. Oh, I love it. Okay. For those of you listening, if you go do this, you need to post on social and tag us so that we can know that you're doing it. That sounds like a lot of fun. I don't yes. want to do it, but I want to see other people doing this, but <laughs> like they tell me they want to do this. So I love it. All right. So we don't have a ton of time left, but I want you, because you know, you have this genius around creativity and innovation, marketing and communications. And so I know one of your things is story plus purpose plus being human equals marketing success. Give your best tips. I hate that question, right? But we have a ton of people listening who they're in professional services, right? Or we even have like doctors, right? So that's still professional services and that you might not be going out and actually pitching to your patients, but the way that you interact with them is really, in my opinion, the way you serve them is the same way that you would want to market to them. What tips do you have for those who maybe struggle with their marketing and putting themselves out there because maybe they're a little too stiff and, you know, they're not being too human or telling too many stories? Right. One of the biggest things that I think we have to think about is if you were to read your own marketing and be honest, like if you were to read your own marketing through the lens of your customer, would it horrify you? Would it make you laugh? Would it make you want to pick up the phone? And it's okay to go, Oh my God, no, that's honest. And we all have those moments. What's the kind of stuff really ask yourself, what's the kind of marketing that makes you stop in your tracks, go, Oh my God, yes. And want to pick up the phone and, and ask yourself, what is it about that? And usually it's because it's informal, it's personal, it's stories. Maybe there's some humor involved. Think about what you really respond to. And then ask yourself, what can I deconstruct from that and use in my own marketing? And I honestly, the, the central piece of all of it, I'm always going to say is storytelling. The more that you can not give jargon and not give marketing speak, but really just tell stories. How did you help somebody? Or, or you know, what's a typical client look like for you? How did you leave them better off in the world? What are some struggles you've had in your business? Tell an honest failure story and how you picked yourself up. The more you can really get to the human nature of it, the more people can see you. I think the big misunderstanding is that we have to be perfect. We have to be out there and have a sanitized version, you know, of ourselves out there. The reality is, is the more you can get to who you are and what you'd be like to work with, like your personality and your humor and all that great stuff, the more you're going to connect with people at that level. So dive deep into stories and don't be nervous to, you know, just be a little bit raw. Get to the heart of those human stories. Yeah. That's so interesting because I feel like I work with a lot of people who are like, well, you know, we work with these really large companies and they expect us to be a very certain way. And so you read the bios and it's like, oh my gosh, boring. Like, why would you do that? <laughs> 
hear you, right? And they're like, yeah, but they're corporate, they're stuffy. And it's like, but they're still humans, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, bios are awful. Write something through the lens of something fun. What's an award you got? You know, I was voted class clown, no shock in grade school. I put that in my bio. I can make my son snort milk out of his nose because I can make him laugh while he's drinking. I put that in my bio. You know, I know I have a very short window to like, for my son to still acknowledge me in public. I put that in my bio, you know, how to lighten up. I mean, you know, cause it's not about, it's not about all the degrees, all that crap. There's a lot of talented people out there at the end of the day. Why do people like working with you? What's the human glue? And maybe it's because you've helped. Maybe one example, it might be that you've helped your collectively authors that you work with sell a million books and get their human message out there. Isn't that a great bio versus they have billions of degrees and they've done this and they've done that, blah, 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 which I don't even like doing bios anymore. I really don't, you know, because I feel like who I am and what I've done in the world, like the degrees I have or the industry experience I have is nice, but that's not who I am. I think your bio has to focus on who you are and how you've helped people. Not your street cred and not your degrees and not all that crap because nobody cares. Yeah. I love this because here's the thing, the people that I work with, and I think that the more degrees you have, we tend to really associate, like we create an identity around our profession and our degrees and what we have accomplished and achieved. And Mm -hmm. because we get to that place where we think that's who we are, and like, that's not who we are. It's almost as if we have lost touch with how to even present who we are, right? To the rest of the world, because like, we don't know. We're just associating ourselves with that degree and with what we've done. And that's part of what I think just starts to make us boring and quite frankly, maybe a little sad and depressed. Oh yeah, for sure. Your degrees don't define you. And I, and you know, cause you're, you know, you're a lawyer, you know, and for me, it's like, you know, I got degrees, but you know what, I, here's the thing that I've learned. I, you're, you're so right. You're, you're not, your your identity is not your degrees. And I think the more educated we are sometimes we need that though, in a certain way. I mean, in Silicon Valley, everybody's hung up on, did you get an MBA and where you went to school? So you, you yep. get the checkbox if you went to Stanford or, or Harvard, wait, whatever. But there's a lot of people like that. So the way that I feel like that I stand out is like, look, I speak the language of business and I speak speak the language of humor and humanity. And that's what I do. So it's nobody cares about all the other details. And and actually, it's not to, it's not false modesty. I mean, it's not that, you know, you're not proud of those accomplishments, but they don't define me. I think one of the things I think if you ask yourself, sit down and ask, you, what am I most proud of in, in my life? I don't think most people are going to say I'm most proud that I got a degree. I think they're going to be most proud of a business they built or how they helped write a book or how they overcame a fear of public speaking. You sit and ask yourself, what am I most proud of? And it's usually about people and relationships. It's not about the degrees you have. I love it. This is such a great way to kind of wrap up. So let me ask you this, Kathy. Mm-hmm. For those who are like, how do I get more Kathy? Like, should they go buy the book? Should they follow you on social? How do they get you as a keynote speaker? I mean, lots of questions here. But I guess question number one is, where do they begin? What would be your recommendation? And then two, if you know they want to dig in, learn more, reach out, what does that look like? Absolutely. So there's a couple of places you can find me. I'm on all the socials. You can certainly follow me there. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn and, and Twitter. And so those are good places. And you can also reach out to me at keepingithuman.com. And you can certainly reach out if you are interested in the book. And I, I'm not here to sell books, but if you are interested, and it's, it's, if you, I believe everybody can use improv because improv is, is not about being funny. I mean, you know, Heather and I both know it's really about how we show up and yes and each other, ourselves and other people and how we say yes and to new ideas. So if you think that that might be something to help you with your marketing or your products or whatever, you can pick up my book, Stop Boring Me on Amazon. I love it. Kathy, thank you so much for joining me. We'll put all of those links in the show notes. Thanks for sharing your wisdom and your stories today on the podcast. It has been such a pleasure, such an honor. Oh my gosh, thank you. The honor is mine. I love talking with you, Heather. I love everything you're about and I love all the good work you're doing. So thank you. Right back at you. All right, guys, that's it for this episode. We will see you next week. For show notes, downloads, and other free resources, and to keep the conversation going, head on over to hustleandflowpodcast.com. See you there.